This is James. James was serving time in a correctional facility for armed robbery. He frequently lashed out at peers and staff. He got into gang-related fights, and he spent a lot of time in seclusion. When his mom didn't visit, yet again, a staff made an offhanded comment, James, she never comes. James got hot all over, felt like he couldn't breathe, his heart was pounding, and he charged across the room and struck that staff as hard as he could right in the head. From the age of two, James remembers regularly watching and hearing his father beat his mother. His father drank a lot, and when he would go off, he would verbally or physically abuse whoever was closest to him, including James. His father supported the family with a variety of dangerous and illegal activities, many of which James witnessed all throughout his childhood. James was nine the night his father was arrested. His father looked him right in the eye and said, you're the man now, I'll be back. But after 18 months in prison, when he was released, his father didn't come back. He never texted, he never called, he never visited, despite the fact he lived within one mile. James heard that his father had another family. James's mom started sleeping with men for money. And James remembers waking up in the middle of the night, hearing his mom having sex with all of these strange men. And he said he felt nauseous and angry at the same time. He wanted to kill those men. He began to hate his mother. One day, James saw his father at the grocery store. His father avoided any eye contact with him and walked the other way. James began running the street and smoking a lot of weed. Soon he was smoking marijuana before school, after school, and eventually he dropped out of school. He was easily recruited into a gang. He was brutally, he was brutally, brutally beaten, and then he brutally retaliated. He saw no value in himself and no value in anyone else. James thought about his father much more than he wanted to. He questioned, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? My, my own father doesn't want to have anything to do with me. And then other times he would think, F my dad. I don't need him. I don't need anybody. Trauma impacts youth's beliefs about themselves, about others, and about the world around them. Based on what they've experienced or witnessed, youth in custody often believe, if you care about someone, they'll hurt you. If, you. if you become close to someone, they'll leave. If someone is nice to you, if someone is nice to you, they'll exploit you. Don't let your guard down, ever. Get to them before they get you. Don't trust anyone. Nobody truly cares about me, Something is wrong with me. I'm worthless. When youth are aggressive in juvenile justice facilities, it can be helpful to ask if the incident was hot-headed or cold-blooded. And what I mean by hot-headed is this reactive aggression. It's an impulsive, angry response in which youth are defending themselves against something they believe is threatening or something unjust is happening. Youth may actually feel badly afterwards that they lost so much control or that somebody got hurt. This hot-blooded aggression is actually very common among traumatized youth. This is in direct contrast to proactive aggression. This is kind of a more calculated, planned, predatory aggression. These youth typically want to intimidate and dominate others. They're trying to do, use their aggression to obtain status, power, or some kind of material goods. And there's usually very little remorse. Both types of aggression should be consequenced, but the way staff does so can play a large role into how much that aggression happens again in the future. Given trauma's effect on the brain, it's not surprising that these youth get in trouble a lot while they're in juvenile detention and correctional facilities. Youth must be held accountable for negative and dangerous behavior, including youth who have been traumatized. However, within juvenile justice facilities, youth can be re-traumatized when confined and locked in small rooms, when physically restrained, especially by multiple staff, when physically searched, especially when that search is invasive, when they're stripped of their clothes or when someone puts, gives them a safety smock because they've reported suicidal thoughts, when they've been observed by staff or harassed by peers while they've been showering, if they've witnessed or been victims of physical or sexual assaults while in custody, 
when no one comes to visit them. If staff are antagonistic or harsh, or if peers are intimidating or violent. It's in these situations that feelings of vulnerability and loss of control can intensify among incarcerated youth who are traumatized. And this often triggers that survival response, that automatically, biologically programmed fight or flight. So youth's argumentative, aggressive, or destructive behavior is likely going to escalate. That typically results in staff giving them more intensive sanctions. So more staff control, more physical restraint, more room confinement, and all of that tends to escalate the youth even further. And that creates a difficult and dangerous situation. So staff respond with longer and harsher sanctions, which trigger youth even further. This cycle can continue with both youth and staff becoming more and more at risk of getting hurt.